Thank you, praise team. Well, it's good to be back with you today. Again, I want to thank you. Every time, uh, it, it just uh, flows over us when we go on vacation and know that the only reason we can is out of your gracious hearts. And I want to thank you for doing that for us. We had a great time uh, together with families. We went to Gallenberg, and we just had a wonderful, blessed time, and then some staycation uh, here at home. But I'm very excited to be here through the rest of this year, Lord willing, and into next year, Lord willing, and see what God is going to continue to do here in your life, in our life here at EC Grace. Amen? Amen. Well, you know, I get excited about every series, and rightfully so. You know, Shannon and I were talking this morning and just talking about the series and reminiscing on a little close to eight years ago when I became the pastor. I said, do you remember, this wasn't fair to her, do you remember the first series I started out with? She was close. And uh, I can look back and think of how God is blessed and carried through all of that. And I'm just excited because here's what we know. No matter where we land in the Word of God, on whatever series we are, it is God's Word and it is special to us and has impact in our life, right? Amen. Well, we just finished uh, all the Jesus series. And I hope and pray that that was impactful into your life. We're going to now kind of go back into the Old Testament. Let me ask you a question. If I mentioned the name Jonah to you, what is the first word that pops into your mind when you think of Jonah? Whale. whale. Fish. Whale. If that was a whale as it was, you're not alone. You could probably ask just about anyone that question. If there's any Bible story that even the man on the streets know, knows that doesn't know much about the Word of God, surely Jonah and the whale is one of them, right? Jonah and the whale. It just seems to go together like peanut butter and jelly, right? <laughs> this morning we're going to begin a study together in the book of Jonah. And I pray it has great impact in your life. We're going to see many, many, many uh, lessons throughout this book that I hope will touch each and every one of us. And I hope that by the time that we are finished, that the first thing you think of when you think of Jonah and you hear that name is not a whale. It's not about a fish. But I pray the very first thing you think of is about our great God. The central message, everyone, of the book of Jonah is not Jonah being swallowed by a great whale or him being a reluctant prophet, but rather God's great love, his compassion, and grace towards sinners, including Jonah. Amen. The book of Jonah, everyone, is a window into the heart of God. It's a beautiful book when you see it that way. It's a window into the heart of God. This will be the title of our series in Jonah. Jonah, a window into the heart of God. The star, everyone, and the chief character of this book is God. It is not Jonah. It is not the whale. It is not Nineveh. All eyes are meant in this book to focus on our great loving God who has a heart of compassion, a heart of love for lost sinners that blankets the world, as well as his compassion and heart for his sinning saints. How many of you are thankful God has a compassionate heart for his sinning saints? Sinning saints. Oh, I so thank God that I'm positionally righteous before him because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But I also know I still sin against him, and I'm so thankful for his compassionate heart. Are you? Amen. All eyes are meant to focus on him. 
it is such a God as this that we're going to see that we should love, that we should overwhelmingly serve and obey, a God that we should overwhelmingly adore and seek to emulate Him all the more. I want us to see when we're done with this series, God's heart of compassion, God's heart of love, God's long-suffering, His forgiveness. I want us to adore Him all the more every single week. And I hope you're doing that every single day. Amen? The opening words are right away a window into God's heart of compassion towards lost sinners. Some of this book, we're going to just do a sentence or two, like today. Other weeks, we're going to bound, and we're going to do a flyover. You'll just bear with me as we go through it. But let's just look at verses 1 and 2 today. God's compassion towards lost sinners. Let's look at verse 1 and 2 together. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. There's how we start out. Here in God's very first words recorded to Jonah that we have is arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. Coupled here, when we see this beginning, opening beginning, I love how the book ends. It's coupled with his last words to Jonah at the end of the book, and this reveals God's heart, everyone. Should I not have compassion upon Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons? Go to Nineveh. Go. Cry against it. Should I not have compassion for Nineveh? Don't you love that? Jonah's answer was, no. <laughs> no. I got to thinking, maybe his name wasn't Jonah, it was Janona. I don't know. No, no. He said no to God. Hmm. I wonder how that works out for anyone when they say no to God's command. He said no, and everything between God's opening words here to Jonah and his last words to Jonah is God basically saying, uh-huh, let's see about that. Let's see about that. We'll look at that together. So while the overall theme of the book is about God's compassionate heart, the sub-theme is about the prophet Jonah. Jonah, whose heart was out of sync with the compassionate heart of God for the lost sinner. And of course, we will have to ask ourselves the very same question throughout the upcoming weeks ahead. To what degree are we in sync? To what degree are we in step, in unity? Or to what degree are we out of sync with God's compassionate heart? I wonder if we really looked at our life if we really were honest with the Holy Spirit, I wonder how much of the Jonah spirit may still be lurking in many of us. Lord, I pray this morning that as we get into this book, your word, looking at the life of Jonah, Lord, that we do see a big, broad, open window into your heart. Lord, we thank you for your love, for your compassion for us. Oh, Lord, we all sit here and we have failed you. Sometimes in our life in mighty, mighty ways. Oh, Lord, all the little sins that lurk into our heart, all the little failures throughout the day, I thank you, Lord, that your blood covers us as we believe in you, Jesus that you paid the price for our sin, that you washed us white as snow, that you, Lord, are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, Lord, may you have glory. May you today be honored. 
May you today be praised. May you today be blessed. As Lord, we yield to you and come before you humbly to see into your heart. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, before we look at our Lord's compassion and his commission to Jonah, which we will do, to arise, to go and cry against Nineveh, let's set things in their historical context, which I think is important as you begin any series. Jonah is the son of Amittai, of whom we know nothing. That's all I have to say about him. <laughs> That's his dad. But Jonah himself is mentioned in the Old Testament, the Old Testament, only one other time, and that's in 2 Kings 14, 23 through 25, and it's during the reign of Jeroboam II, the evil king of Israel. The year here is about 780 B.C. In 2 Kings, we are told that Jonah was a prophet of the Lord who lived in Gath-Hafer, Gath-Hafer which was just a few miles north of Nazareth in Lower Galilee, actually the future hometown of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Therefore, the book of Jonah then is one of 12 books in the Old Testament, and it's called the Minor Prophets, all right? Called minor, not because they're less important, okay? Not because they're less inspired, but simply because they are much shorter books than the larger ones of the five major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. But while the book here of Jonah may be small, and I hope you've all read through it, it is like a pocket rocket in lessons and challenges for us today. It's a very amazing book. So let's Look now at the Lord's compassionate heart in his commission to Jonah to arise, to go, to cry against Nineveh. We will see this develop much deeper throughout the series. But today, I just want us to see something very important right up front in the book. The first thing I want us to see is we see God's compassionate heart in that God is concerned at all about the Ninevites. Okay? Here's one thing we must know in the, uh, of that day. There was a separation between Israel and the nations around them. The Ninevites were not Israelites. They were not Israelites. They were people outside of God's covenant with Israel, all right? But God's going to do something. He's going to teach Jonah, the Israelite, a lesson that Israel had a hard time learning, not just here, but throughout Scripture, namely that God's love and compassion was as broad as the entire world. Amen. The covenant people of Israel, they were slow to learn that God cared deeply for other people. In fact, that He cared deeply for all people. They were slow to learn this. Let's remember something from Scripture. From the very beginning, God said to Abraham, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Then we go over to Galatians. The Scriptures foreseen that, what, that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. Verse 16 goes on to say, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed. That is Christ who came and paid the price on the cross. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, and all the nations of the world would be blessed through them and through Christ. 800 years later, the same Lord that spoke to Jonah had to teach another Israelite. Remember? Peter, the very same lesson. Guess what? At the same place, Joppa. Pretty cool, huh? We saw this in our series, Acts, the Church on the Move. Do you remember that series? 
Okay. <laughs> we had a message entitled, The Israelite and the Italian. The Israelite and the Italian. That God had to convince good old reluctant Peter in a dream three times over of a sheet full of unclean animals that the gospel was to go into the world beyond the borders of Judaism. It was a momentous turning point in Acts where God supernaturally and wonderfully brought an Israelite, Peter, and an Italian, Cornelius, together, and he threw open the gospel to the Gentiles. A moment in history in which we who are believing Gentiles today have reaped the blessing. If you know Christ is your Lord and Savior, you have reaped this blessing. Amen? Amen. Praise God for that. I also want us to see God's compassionate heart, not only in His concern for the Ninevites, but in His, but in his concern for such corrupt people as the Ninevites. Look at verse 1 and 2. It says, their wickedness has come up to me. Nineveh, everyone, was a major metropolis in Assyria, which is modern-day Iraq, all right, located near the banks of the Tigris River. The city was actually founded by Nimrod, <laughs> who rebelled against God, you remember, and led in the building of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 10 and 11. It had a bad start. God called it a great city, meaning large in extent and numbers, not greatness in moral character. And indeed it was. In that Nineveh, it was no backwater village in that day. Jonah 3.3 3 tells us that it was an exceedingly great city, a three-day walk. It took Jonah three days to walk through the city, all right? And early historians and archaeology refers to it as a city somewhat about 60 miles wide. Jonah 4.11 tells us it was well over 120 miles thousand people. So this great city was also a gross city filled with idolatrous immorality in the worship of its many gods. Many, many, many gods. But especially of Ishtar, the goddess of fertility. They were absolutely sexually immoral, idolatrous, wicked people. It also was violent. It was a city of wickedness, and violence. You see that in 3.8. How, can any of you name for me a book that deals directly with Nineveh? Nahum. Nahum. Nahum is another of the minor prophets. He wrote a whole book on the subject of Nineveh, describing it as a city completely full of lies, harlotries, and sorceries, but especially as a bloody city. Nahum 3, 1 through 4. And a bloody city it was, if you really study the history of Nineveh. Nahum 3, 1 says, Woe to the, bloody, to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. Nineveh was a city of violence. They were known for their brutal treatment of anyone they conquered and captured. They were notorious for amputating people's hands and feet, gouging out eyes, and skinning and impaling their captives. In fact, the final verse of Nahum's book emphasizes the violence of the Assyrians in the form of a rhetorical question in, uh, in uh, Nahum 3.19, who has not felt your endless cruelty? Nineveh was known for its cruelty, its atrocities committed upon those that she conquered. Nineveh's kings, Assyria's kings, bragged of flaying men and women alive and removing their skin from them from head to toe while alive, of lining the walls of the city with the heads of their victims and impaling them on stakes alongside the road of the city and also burning them alive torching up the lights entering into the city. 
This doesn't even cover all the wickedness and immorality and idolatry. You may say, did he have to put all of that on the screen to read? You might have been thinking, okay, enough. Couldn't he have just said some of it and just kind of broadened and just say, hey, they were bad, bad. No, because I could have given so much more, and I wanted you to hear it, and I wanted you to read it. Why? Because unless we really know the depravity about Nineveh, you will never begin to truly understand why Jonah balked when God said, go to them. Jonah knew all this about the Ninevites. Israel themselves had experienced their overwhelming cruelty to this degree in the past. But one greater reason we must really understand about Nineveh, even more so than understanding Jonas's callous heart, when we know about the depths of the wickedness of Nineveh, the very depth of their depravity, we can begin, notice, begin to understand the scope and appreciate and even stand in amazement of God's heart of love and compassion for the lost, for He loved them. This allows us to see into the window of God's heart. Such a wicked, corrupt, immoral, and cruel people. And as much as they were that, amazingly, God cared for them. God was concerned for them. You know, here's the fact. There is no person so wicked who has done so much wrong or delved into so much evil that God cannot or will not forgive them or relent often of the punishment due them if they would but repent and turn to him in belief and faith. Amen. Now we're going to see that as we keep going. Third, God's compassion is seen in calling Jonah to confront the Ninevites about their sin. He says, arise, go, and cry. All three of these are imperatives, therefore they're commands right? That is, do what I say. The NIV, everyone, if you have the NIV, which I do like that translation very much, it does drop the word arise, perhaps thinking that it's implied in the word go. But it is there in the Hebrew text, that word, and it carries the forceful meaning of immediately, all right? It means Stop what you're doing, stand up, and go. Which, by the way, would be a walk for Jonah of about 500 miles to the north. And the Lord expected to, Jonah to get on with it. If it were just go, Jonah could say, sure, next year. How many of you parents tell your kids, Hey, go do the dishes, please. You come back two or three hours later, they're still there. You didn't stipulate a time. But how about this? Hey, get up off the couch right now and go do the dishes. Do they understand you expect immediately, immediately to be done? Arise, meaning get up now and go. And when you get there, God said, Get to work, cry out, cry against it, for their wickedness has come up to me. The NIV too has translated this as preach against, which I believe weakens the force of the word cry, which carries the idea of an emergency. It carries the idea of an impassioned plea, urgency. You see, God's compassion is coming first to Nineveh because his judgment is not far behind. For example, this word cry. Look at what cry meant when God told Isaiah to cry against the house of Jacob. 
In Isaiah 58, 1, he says, cry loudly, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression and to the house of Jacob their sins. Jonah is to go to the city of Nineveh, confront them with their sin before God, and warn them that unless they repent, Nineveh will be overthrown, Jonah 3, 4. How? By God's burning anger, in which they would all, Jonah 3, 9, perish, perish. No wonder God told him to arise meaning go now, go and cry. What we're seeing is time is running out, yet the Lord will warn them before his wrath falls upon them. You see, in God's holiness, in his perfect justice, he has no obligation to do this, does he? But in his compassion, in his long-suffering and patience, he sends Jonah to warn them so that if they were willing, he might forgive them. Is that amazing about God? Amen. Think of this. When God says, their wickedness has come up before me, what does he mean? He doesn't mean that he just found out <laughs> or just realized, whoa, I just realized something. None of us really wicked. God is saying that the stench and the stink of their sin is so evil and wickedness has been rising and rising and rising. And it is now to the point where God is sick of it. It's about to end it all. God's about to bring judgment, and it was on the horizon. We see this language elsewhere in Scripture. This same idea of sin rising to the point of judgment is also seen in Genesis, where we are told that the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, remember, were so great and so exceedingly great that those sins cried out to God for punishment and judgment, Genesis 18, 20 and 19, 13. Remember what God said to Abel's brother Cain. God said to Cain who murdered him that the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. You know, everyone, there comes a point when the very sins and abominations of people, of cities, and of nations reach the limit of God's long suffering and they begin to cry out out for the judgment of God. But hey, let's not miss the point. You see, God's compassion is seen in confronting the Ninevites about their wickedness and sin. Before his judgment fell, when then it would be too late to repent and be saved. That's monumental. The Ninevites had reached that point and God, in his compassion and his mercy, he commissioned Jonah to go warn them and give them one last chance to repent or else face his just justice. We cannot overlook this fact. As we saw in the Hear Jesus series, that today one is considered hateful, judgmental, even unloving to tell people that they are wrong or in sin. To tell people that the wages of their sin, death, will be paid. How desperately, how unkind and unloving is it to confront and not warn when a person is on the path to destruction? If you really knew someone was on a path to destruction, under the wrathful, just hand of God, how unloving is it to say nothing? Amen. To do nothing. 
Sometimes the depth and degree of our concern and compassion and love for people is actually shown by standing up and speaking against those actions. What they are doing, that what they are doing is wrong and sinful, and look what God says about this, and placing them, and that they're placing themselves in the imminent danger of God's judgment. We saw this back in uh, here, Jesus, when we looked at the tolerant church. Think about this for a moment. I want you to really think about this. Contemplate this. It is the kindness of God that speaks against the sin of the sinner. He doesn't have to do that at all. All he has to do, if he wanted to, is judge it justly. It's his kindness that he would even speak of the sin of the sinner, that they might see their sin, that they might turn to God, that they might turn to him in repentance, that they might turn to him in belief and faith for salvation, thus escaping his burning anger that he speaks about in Jonah 3, 9, that will fall on the unrepentant, rebellious sinner for all, all of eternity. This is actually a fact. This world is made up of human beings. We are all going to die, and there's only two places to go, to be with the Lord or to be absent from Him in hell forever. This is a sense, and this is a truth of urgency, and it's only a good, loving, kind, compassionate God who would even take the time to warn sinners of their sin. D.L. Moody, he pictured a scene on that mountain slope when the risen Lord Jesus commissioned his first disciples and commissioned the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone. There on that scene, Moody's picturing this. And he pictures Peter's wide-eyed wonder as he asked Jesus if... Lord, must we go to those who drove the nails into your hands? And Jesus said, yes. Okay, Lord. Wide-eyed, he then says, must we go to the man who drove the spear into your side? Yes, oh yes, especially to him. Tell him something for me. Tell them there's a nearer way to my heart than that. And you know, as we saw in Acts, the disciples, the apostles, the early church would enter into the compassion of Jesus for the world. They would now enter into a new worldview. When the Holy Spirit would come upon them at Pentecost and begin to break down all their human boundaries, to break down all their walls, and give to them a world vision that was now a kingdom vision. A full view into the heart of the Lord. You see, what Jonah needed, and we also need, is to get our minds and our hearts into the great wide flow of God's heart, of God's love, of His compassion for all sinning, suffering, struggling, sorrowing men and women. We need to jump into the flow of Almighty God's heart. Let it flow you where God wants to take you so that you can grab others and bring them in through the Holy Spirit. So yes, Jonah He must arise, he must go, and cry, yes, Jonah, even against wicked Nineveh. And you know, we just need to know this, and I know we do. There are still wicked people in the world today. Modern-day Ninevites practicing some of the grossest harlotries and sorceries, all sorts of wickedness and violence and overwhelming idolatry. But the bottom line is this. We know this because the Word of God tells us this, and we shouldn't be surprised by this. We know there's a simple solution. 
They need the Lord. Amen. They need the Lord. And God has called us to arise, go, and cry unto them. Tell them about me. Tell them about me who died for them. Tell them, show them a window into my heart. Go warn them. Cry to them. My judgment's coming. I want them to know me. Go proclaim me to them. Please tell them what I've done. Tell them of my love. Tell them if they'll just yet call upon me and believe in my name, I will save them. I will give them new life. Amen. You know, there's a song. You all, you all know it. It's an old song. People need the Lord, right? It says, every day they pass me by. And I actually believe we don't even see them passing us by. I can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care. Headed who knows where. On they grow through private pain. Living Fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. And it goes on to say, people need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, he's the open door. When, it asks, will we realize people need the Lord? It goes on, we are called to take his light to a world where wrong seems right. What could be too great a cost for sharing life with one who's lost? Through his love, our hearts can feel all the grief they bear. They must hear the words of life. Only we can share. Truly, people need the Lord. What a song. What truer words. As we start this series, we are not going to be every week into being an evangelist. There are going to be numerous lessons throughout this book. But as we see the heart of God and the compassion of God, and we see his love for humanity, we will not be able to escape the great urgent call to realize people need the Lord. They must hear the words of life that only we can share, says the song. You know, as the praise team comes up, you know, he's called us to meet that need by sharing the love of Christ for them. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 through 21, before you go there, I believe is a beautiful verse. And I feel most privileged to be in that verse. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Can you think of a greater privilege for God himself to choose you to be his ambassador? As though God were making an appeal through us we beg you on behalf of Christ. That word beg comes out of cry. Here is a pleading, a begging for people to be reconciled to their Savior, to be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I don't know why he chose me to be his ambassador, why he chose me to see the truth, why he chose me to be covered with his blood. But I'm thankful of that wonderful gift and privilege. Listen, if you haven't read Jonah lately, Please read it this week. Next week, we're going to start to look closely at Jonah. We're going to look at the man. The message will be entitled, Wrong Way Jonah. And we will continue to look into the window of God's heart. We will see many uh, blessings and lessons along the way. 
But I hope and pray one above all that we will see is that we see the love of God for you, that we see the love of God for me, and that we see the love of God for the lost and dying world. Let's stand and sing.